say happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy uh, I want to thank Brother Billy. Um, he shared with me that was a song of experience a few weeks back, and I told him when I come back, I would like for him to sing that uh, for special music. He shared with me that he was going through something at one particular point, and the Lord woke him up in the middle of the night, uh, I believe 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and put that song on his heart. So that is a song of experience, my brothers and sisters. So we want to praise God for that. Amen? I also want to say Happy New Year. I know that we are three weeks in, um, but it's my first time seeing you. Amen? Uh, so I want to wish you a Happy New Year. And uh, in light of New Year, you know, my wife and I, we, um, of course, you know, this time of year, everyone does what? Make New Year's resolution. And unfortunately, not all of us are that resolute about our New Year's resolution. So my wife and I began to go through the Bible in the spirit of prophecy to study uh, New Year's and how we should begin New Year's and how we can be more resolute about New Year's resolutions. And uh, we found something very interesting, uh, which is kind of what led me to uh, this year-long study on the sanctuary. And I'm just asking that you turn me your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 40. Exodus, chapter 40. Uh, it's amazing what you find when you go through the Bible in the Spirit of Pride. You know that every aspect of life, uh, you can find answers and solutions right in God's Word. Exodus chapter 4, again, Father, we pray as we open these words that the Spirit of God may lead us, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 40, let me know when you're there, Exodus chapter 40, beginning at verse 1, and the Bible says, still hear a few leaves turn in Exodus chapter 40, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, on the what? Of the what? Now, we're not going to say that that was January 1st, but whatever month or time period of the year that was for Israel, we know that was New Year's for them. Amen? Amen. So it says, also on the first day of the first month, shalt thou set up the what? The tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Now, what is a tabernacle? It's a place of worship. It, it's, it's very close. It's actually a dwelling place. When you look up the word tabernacle, that word tabernacle actually means a dwelling place. So one of the things that we have resolved, and when I think of a dwelling place, especially for God, I think of three places. One, our bodies. Amen? Amen. Our bodies should be a tabernacle for God, a dwelling place for God. Also, I think of our homes. So as my wife and I were studying these principles, like we said first and foremost, we want our bodies to be a dwelling place for God. And then we also want our homes to be a tabernacle for God. Amen? Amen? And then also, we want our church to be a tabernacle for God. Therefore, for this entire year, every third Sabbath when I'm here, we'll be studying the sanctuary, and the series is entitled, Where Is He Now? Now, today's specific topic is entitled, Two Questions That God Cannot Answer. Two Questions that God cannot answer. But one of the things that i like for us to resolve for this year, as we're putting together our New Year's resolutions, is that we'll make our hearts a tabernacle for God. Amen? Amen. We should say, Lord, I want you to come and pitch a tabernacle in my heart. Then we say, Lord, I want you to pitch a tabernacle in our, what? What's the second one? In our homes. And then say, Lord, I want us to pitch a tabernacle in our church. So for this year, we're going to pitch a tabernacle here at Advent Hope. Is that all right? Amen. Now, let me say this. There is no topic that is more vital, more essential. In fact, let me say, make a bold statement. It is impossible for you to truly have the experience as a Seventh-day Adventist and understand the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines without an understanding of the sanctuary. Did you hear the word that I used? I said impossible. Now, I don't make statements like that without backing it up. Amen? Let's go in our Bibles. Let's go, get, go to the book of Psalm 73. And let's notice what the Bible says in verse 17, Psalm 73, verse 17. And let's notice what the Bible says in Psalm 73 and verse 17. 
Are we there? Now, what's the word that I used that was strong? I said what? Impossible. We're going to find that word in the spirit of prophecy, but here it is in principle. The Bible says, until I went into the what? Sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. In other words, the psalmist is saying that there's some things that I cannot understand unless I go somewhere. And where is that place? In the sanctuary. In the book of Evangelism, page 221, paragraph 1, Ella White says, A correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. On that same page, he said, The sanctuary service was the key that un unlocked the mystery and shows us our present work and position. Do we need to understand the sanctuary? Yes. Now let's get some inspiration. Notice what it says here in the book of Evangelism, page 221, paragraph 3. It says the subject of the what? And the investigative judgment. Now does the investigative judgment have anything to do with the sanctuary? Yes. We're going to study that this year. Amen? It says, and should be what? What's this word? Clearly understood by the people of God. All, what's this word, saints? Need a knowledge for themselves of the what? One, the position to the work of who? Now keep that in mind. Of their who? Their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be, what's this word? Impossible for them to exercise the faith that is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Does it sound like this is important? Amen. Yes. Now notice it says that they should understand the position and work of who? Their great high priest. Who's that high priest, by the way? That's Jesus. Praise God. It continues. It says, as a people, we should be earnest students of what? Now somebody says, we're studying the sanctuary. Why are you mentioning prophecy? Does the sanctuary have anything to do with prophecy? Yes. What is the key prophecy for Seventh-day Adventists? Unto 2,300 days, what's the word? Then shall the sanctuary be, be cleansed. It says, as a people, they, we should be earnest students of prophecy. We should not rest until we become what? Intelligent in regard to the subject of the sanctuary, which is brought out in the vision of Daniel and John. Now, what book, did, uh, what book did John write? We know he wrote the book of John as well, but he also wrote the book of Revelation. So we see that the sanctuary has everything also to do. In fact, if you do an outline of the book of Revelation, you, you recognize that the whole book of Revelation is going through the sanctuary. The entire book, from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22. Tw chapter 22 is when Jesus leaves the sanctuary. Are you with me? It says, which is brought out in the vision of Daniel and John. This subject sheds great light on the what? What's this word? Now what did the previous reference say? Our great high priest. Now this one says, our present position and work. So the sanctuary lets us understand two things. The present position of work of our great high priest and then our present position of work. And that's why the series is entitled, Where is he now? Where is he now? See, once we understand Jesus' present position and work, then we understand what we should be doing in harmony with what Jesus is doing where he is. Are you with me, saints? Amen. So that's two things we need to understand. His position and his work, and then our position and our work. And it says, and gives us unmistakable proof that God has led us in our past experience. Does it sound like it's important, brothers and sisters? I think it's so important that we need to pause and pray again. What do you say? Let's pray. Let's kneel together. Father in heaven, there's nothing more vital for Seventh-day Adventists than an understanding of where Jesus is right now. And I pray, dear Father, that as we go through the series this year, that you can truly pitch a tabernacle in our hearts, in our homes, and in our church. Lord, we pray that this year, Lord, we will truly resolve to ensure that our hearts are right with thee, dear Father. 
and that our sins may be gone into that sanctuary to be cleansed. Lord, we beg your forgiveness where we have come short. We beg your forgiveness, Lord, where we have not been holistically given every aspect of our hearts to you there, Father. Forgive us for anything that we have been holding on to that is unlike Jesus. 170 years, Lord. You have been doing the dirty work. And who has kept you there? It is I. We must all take personal responsibility, dear Father. And we beg, dear Father, that today you begin the process of truly cleansing our sanctuaries. For this we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. Two questions God cannot answer. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. And we're going, to find, we're going to study today why is there a need of a sanctuary. Genesis chapter 1, and let's notice what the Bible says in verses 26 and 27. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Why is there a need of a sanctuary? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Are we there? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Drop down to 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, when God made man, whose image was man made in? Go over to Genesis chapter 5. Let's go there quickly. Genesis chapter 5 and let's look at verses 1 through 3. So we established thus far that God made man in his own image. And we're studying why was there a need of a sanctuary. We saw that God made man in his own image. Now notice what takes place in Genesis chapter 5. Verse 1, the Bible says, This is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. There again, the Bible established that man was making a likeness of who? Of God. Verse 2, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Verse 3 says, and Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his, who's his? Own likeness after his, who's his? Image and called the name what? So we see that when God created man, man was made in whose image? God's image. Now we see that in Genesis chapter 5, the Bible says that man is now made in whose image? Now, there had to be something in between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 5 that caused a change. Are you with me? What was it that caused a change from man being made in the image of God to now being made in the image of man? What was in between? Sin. Let's go back in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and beginning at verse 7. Genesis 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, God gave us explicit instruction. Now, notice the instruction that God gave to Adam. And he planted the Lord, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed, and out of the ground God made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 16. And the Lord God com commanded the man, saying, now notice the Bible says, He commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest, what? Freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eateth thereof thou shalt, what? Shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. We're going to come back to that. We know the story. You go to Genesis chapter 3. And what happened in Genesis chapter 3? We know that they were disregarding the counsels of God. Uh, Eve was beguiled by the serpent. She ate the fruit. And then she brought it to her husband. His, the husband ate the fruit. And they, they sinned against God. You, you notice that. You know that. Amen? Now look what, what, what the Bible says in verses 9. Let's start with 8. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And the Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife did what? They hid themselves from the what? From the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the, 
of the garden. Now let me say this, my brothers and sisters. In the book of Romans chapter 16 and verse 9, the Bible says, I will have you simple, uh, God, in fact, let me just say this first. It was never God's intention for, for man to know what evil was. And that's why God says, I will have you wise concerning that which is good and then simple concerning evil. He never intended for us to know what evil was. That's Romans chapter 16 and verses 9. So as a result of them venturing off to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they ate the fruit, and now they know what evil was. Now let me say this, they had an intimate relationship with God at the time. But now when God came to talk with them as he normally did, and to walk with them as he normally did, they had to do something that's different from what they normally did. Why? Because of sin. Instead of embracing the presence of God and running to the presence of God and loving the presence of God, what did they do, saints? They hid themselves. Why? Because the Bible says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. Are you with me so far? Now, let's go into our Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59 and notice what the Bible says in verse 2. Sin is a separator, my brothers and sisters. Isaiah chapter 59, and let's notice what the Bible says in verse 2. And that's why we cannot play around with sin, my brothers and sisters. Someone said the, the fruit was just something simple. That, you know what that shows? God has no tolerance for sin. Even the little things. Are you with me? The minute details. God says there is no tolerance that I have for sin. Notice what sin does. And this is why they had to hide themselves from God. Isaiah chapter 59, uh, beginning at verse 2. The Bible says, But your what? Your iniquities have done what? Separated between you and your God and your what? Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God says, my brothers and sisters, when there are sins that you are holding on to in your life, it causes a separation between me and you. And that's why we cannot hold on to sin, because if we hold on to sin, then we cause a separation from who? From God. Do we want to be separated from God? So there's something that needs to be separated from us so that we are not separated from God, and that is what? And that is sin. And that's why I'm amazed when I hear messages when people are scared to talk about sin. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, Cry a loud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sins. And we're told in the book, Education, page 57, the greatest one in the world is the one of men. Men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to do what? To call sin by its right name. The Bible says, my brothers and sisters, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 2, it says, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. If we do not tell people, my brothers and sisters, that sin is the number one killer in the world, every sickness that has taken place in this world, every disease and death that has taken place in this world has its root in sin. Why we would not want to tell people about sin, my brothers and sisters? Sin is the number one killer in the world. Are you with me? Is that something that we should be hiding from people? We need to tell them that sin kills. Are you with me? So we see that sin is what caused Death caused separation from God, and the Bible says your iniquities have separated thee from thy God. Are we together so far as we are studying the sanctuary? Now, let's notice these words. Let's notice these words. Now, when we hear messages that says all you have to do is love, when we hear messages, uh, you know, I call it the grace machine. When we hear those grace machine messages, my brothers and sisters, that does not show the balance between love and what? And discipline. Love and obedience, you know what that is? They're preaching a message of the first lie that was ever told. Every message that teaches love without obedience is saying, thou shalt not surely die. Let me show that to you. It says, the only one who promised Adam life in disobedience was what? The great deceiver. 
There are many messages that are kindled from our pulpits, my brothers and sisters, that teach us that we don't have any regard to disobedience. We don't have to listen to everything that God has said. They say, look, that's just this little thing. Don't worry about that. You know what that says? Thou shall not surely die. That's spiritualism, my brothers and sisters. Don't worry about actions. Don't worry about behavior. Don't worry about that. As long as you pray every night, that's the deceiver, my brothers and sisters. Thou shalt not surely die. It says, and the declaration of the serpent to even Eden, ye shall not surely die, was what? Was the first sermon ever preached upon the immortality of the soul. And we see many sermons are being preached on the same thing today. It says, yet... This declaration resting solely upon the authority of who? Of Satan is echoed from the pulpits of Christendom and is received by the majority of mankind as readily as it was received by our what? Our first parents. We see that same sermon is being preached throughout the ages. Thou shalt not surely die. Sin kills. Does the Bible say sin kills? Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. What does the Bible say? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You know what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. My brothers and sisters, sin kills. Now, we know that sin came into the world. We established that. Adam and Eve both transgressed God's law. Now they've separated themselves from God. And now both man and God is in a tough predicament. Why? The man now realizes that he's been deceived and now he's separated from the God he loves. And God also recognizes that man was deceived and he's separated from the man that he loves. What is God to do? You know what God says? Psalm 77 and verse 13. You know what God says? Thy way, O God, is where? Is in the sanctuary. God says, the only solution that I have to cause man and God to come back together, I have to establish a service that shows man what sin truly does, and God had to prepare a ransom so that that man can now be reunited with himself. And God says, thy way, O God, is where? Is in the sanctuary. And God did not come to save man in sin, because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save the people from their sins. Are you with me so far? So we see that God established a plan. And the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, than he laid down his life for a, a friend. Now I was thinking about this. You know, I began to think, if this whole thing happened unbeknownst. Let's just say, you know, that the, the, the Eve just happened to wander off and wander over to the tree and she got deceived by the serpent and God recognized she was deceived and she sinned and God says, look, they just did a, a quick rally and they come together and said, we have to do something. The, 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 you know, even Adam sinned. What are we going to do? Let's, let's, let's do something. Oh, Jesus, are you going to die? And then he died. That would have still been a great manifestation of love. But you know what is a greater manifestation of love? When Adam and Eve sinned, God knew that they were sin. They would sin even before they were created. I remember I was in Romania, and I was doing a youth class, and I get asked that question all the time: Why did God make Adam and Eve known that they were going to sin? But this person asked a different question: Why did God make Lucifer? knowing that he was going to sin. How do you answer that? I had to pray. And uh, I began to pray. Then God gave me an analogy. As I counseled, there's some woman uh, that had a miscarriage, and 30, 40 years later, they're still mourning and weeping and grieving over that child that they have never seen, never born, never developed. The ch child didn't even get a heartbeat. Child didn't develop lungs, didn't breathe, didn't speak, they didn't touch, handle, feel the child, but yet there's still a place in their heart for that child. And 30 years later, they're still affected, even though the child was never born, miscarriage. And I began to think, and I said, Lord, you had it in your heart 
to make Lucifer. You had it in your heart to make men. And even if you did not make him because of what they were going to do, there would have been an emptiness in your heart, so you did what was necessary to save man. And that's why the Bible says, my brothers and sisters, greater love has no man than this. Then he laid down his life for a friend. You've, we've had the experiences. We have many mothers and fathers here. Have we had a wayward children? Yes. Have we had children that has caused you heartache and and, and, and pain and, and, and suffering and, and sleepless nights. We've had that. Now what if somebody says, I know you have that wayward child. I know he gives, causes you so much heartache and, and, and so much pain, so I, 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 I'm going to do you a great favor. I have this child. He's been trained. He's been, he's been disciplined. He, he, he listens to everything that you say. He's, he, I, I mean, he's good. So I'm going to give you to him so you can just forget about that child that you have that's so wayward. Would that now fill the void that's in your heart, the pain that's in your heart? It wouldn't. Why? Because that child is not yours. And God, even if he said, look, I'm not going to make the world any, even though he had it in his heart to make us, my brothers and sisters, he had you and I in mind, and the Bible says God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. And that's why it says, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. And the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Even before we were born, my brothers and sisters, God loved us from everlasting. That's amazing. This is, I mean, I, when I was sitting down and studying things, I'm like, Lord, you are so amazing. John 3, 16, is, that's why I made our scripture reading. It's as if I've never read that text before. God so loved the world that he gave his son. And then go with me in the Bible to the book of Romans chapter 5. Let's go there together. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, let's go there quickly. Romans chapter 5, let's notice what the Bible says in verse 8. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, But God commendeth his love towards who? In that while we were yet what? Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, while we have separated ourselves, while we have caused our, because of sin and iniquity, we caused ourselves to be now segregated and separated from God, God came to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? Adam, I want you back, Adam, I miss you, and I know that I'll, I'll do whatever it takes, Adam, to regain that relationship that we once had. Where are you, Adam? And he's still asking us that question today, my brothers and sisters. Greater love. Now, I was studying these principles, and I noticed what it says here. It says, the fall of man with how many? Come on, saints, what's this word say? With what? With all its consequences. Now, uh, uh, saints, think. What does it mean by all its consequences? 6,000 years of death, 6,000 years of losing loved ones, 6,000 years, 6, years of, of, of broken homes and broken marriages, 6,000 years of death, billions of lives lost. God even had to wipe out entire nations, entire world, 6,000 years, and then he knew that his son had to die. So God, with all its consequences, was what? Was not hidden from the omnipotent. Redemption was not, and what? And, and, and I want you to know, as I said it before, that even if it was an afterthought, it wouldn't change the love of God. But what makes love even a greater manifestation is the fact that it was not an afterthought. He knew it. He said redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of, Ma of Adam, but a what? An eternal purpose. My brothers and sisters, when I was studying this principle, I said greater love has no man than this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's no greater love that's manifested, my brothers and sisters. Now, does the Bible say the same thing? Yeah. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 says, The land that was slain from the foundation of the earth. Now, let's go in our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. Revelation 13, 8 says, The lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. There's other text. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's notice what the Bible says in verse 20. 1 Peter 1 and verse 20. Let's notice what the Bible says. Are we there? 
The Bible says, who verily was what? Foreordained. What does that word foreordained mean? Foreordained before what? The foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for to you. So this plan was always there, my brothers and sisters. It was just revealed to Adam when it happened to Adam. It was just revealed to us when it happened to us, but the plan was always there. God had an eternal purpose. He knew what was going to take place, and he had something in place as a result so that man can be reunited back to Jesus. Amen. We ought to say amen. amen. Let's go look at one more. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And let's notice what the Bible says in verse 5. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Let's notice what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. The Bible says in verse 4 also, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in what? In love. So God says, even before the world was made, there was a plan in place, and the plan is so that you can now, what does the rest of the verse say? Be holy and what? And without blame, where? Before him, in what? In love. So God says, as a result of this plan, I know the consequences. I know what it's going to cause. But I know that at the end of the day, or at the end of the world, amen, I'll be re reunited with the ones that I love. Mm -hmm. And the ones that love me will be reunited with me once again. There was a ransom, praise God. Amen. But there's also a reunion. It goes on. When man sinned, all heaven was filled with sorrow. Out of harmony with the nature of God, unyielding to the claims of his law, naught but the structures before the human race. Since the divine law is, a ch is as changeless as the character of God, there could be no hope for man unless somewhat. I wonder what that way is. Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And where is Jesus found? He's in the sanctuary. Who's the lamb? Jesus. Who's the priest? Jesus. Who's the bread? Jesus. Whoever liveth to make intercession for us? Jesus. Who's the light of the world? Jesus. Who's in the most holy place? Jesus. Every aspect of the sanctuary, my brothers and sisters, is Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the way to salvation. Are you with me? He says, uh, no hope for man unless some way could be devised whereby his transgression might be pardoned. His nature what? Now this is the purpose of the century, my brother and sister, so that our nature will be renewed so that the Bible can be fulfilled where it says, we, it does not, my brother and sister, it does not appear what we shall be. Only by faith. But we know that when he appear, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. We can claim this by faith, and when God sends something our way through the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, we might not see the end, but we said, all that the Lord saith we shall do. Are you with me? We don't have to be like Israel to go back and forth, but when we see, my brothers and sisters, we exercise the faith and let the feelings come later because early writing page 72 says, faith is God's to give and joyful, uh, faith is uh, ours to, uh, let me say it right, faith is ours to exercise, but joyful feeling is God's to give. Are you with me? Are you with me, saints? So it says, his nature renewed and his spirit, what? Restored to the what? Reflect the image of God. Now notice it says, divine love had conceived such a what? So the question is again, what is the plan and what is the way? Thy way, O God, is what? Is in the sanctuary. Now do you see the need, my brothers and sisters, why we need to pitch a tabernacle for the entire year? 
Salvation is found in the sanctuary. Everything that we believe, every experience that we must have is found right there in the sanctuary. And God says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And that's why David says, until I went into the sanctuary, then understood I their end. David said, now I see the end, Lord. When I looked at the fact that I am adulterer, when I look at the fact that I was a murderer, when I look at the fact that my hands had so much blood on it, I could not understand, but now that I went into the sanctuary, then I understood my end. David said, I couldn't see it. But now that the veil is opened, and now that I can see what Jesus is doing, when I can see that lamb, when I can see that priest, when I can see the ministration that's done in the holy place, when I can see the ministration that Jesus is doing in the most holy place, when I see the love of God manifested in his son, then I understand my end. Where he had to go into the sanctuary. Are oh, you listening to me this morning, my brothers and sisters? In the work of creation, Christ was with God. He was one with God, equal uh, with him. He alone, the creator of man, could be his savior. Now, notice the good grace of the angel. Notice what they wanted to do. It says, No angel of heaven could reveal the Father to the sinner and win him back to the alliance with God. But Christ could manifest the Father's love, for God was in Christ reconciling the world, what? Unto himself. So we see that angels wanted to give themselves as well. They said, I see that man has separated. They see the grief and the pain that are caused to the Father. They see that they can no longer minister to, the, uh, to, 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 to man as they wanted to. So they said, Lord, uh, something needs to be done. Let me give my own life. But they didn't understand. They didn't understand the plan of redemption. We're told it wasn't until the cross that the angels understood. So obviously they could not have been the ones to what? To give their lives. Not only that, my brothers and sisters, it can only be one that is equal to the law because the law is unchangeable. It must be one that is a characteristic of the law. So that's the only one that could give a ransom for the, 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 the fall of man. It had to be Jesus. There was no other way. They wanted to. But Christ could manifest the Father's love, for God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling the, the world unto himself. Now, question. We read the text all the time. For God so, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, question, was that an easy decision for the Father to make? Let's find out. Said the angel, Think ye that the Father yielded up his dearly beloved Son without a what? Without a struggle? No, no, it was even a struggle with the God of heaven whether to let guilty man perish or to give his darling son to what? To die for them. It says angels were so interested for men's salvation that there could be found among them those who would yield their glory and give their life for the what? For perishing man. Now we're thankful that they had that desire in their heart. But they didn't understand that they couldn't do that. It goes on. But, said my accompanying angel, that would avail nothing. The transgression was so great that an angel's life would not pay the debt. Now notice this word. What's this word? Nothing but the death and intercession of God's Son would pay the debt and save lost man from hopeless sorrow. For God, so what? Love the world. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Let's go back there. Romans chapter 8. And let's notice what the Bible says in verse 32. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. And we're going to begin, begin to come to a close. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. Today's just an introduction. Why is there a need of the sanctuary? Why a need? Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. The Bible says, He that spared not his what? But delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us what? 
all things. God says, look, I know that man is lost. I know that man has separated himself from me. Now I'm willing to give you all things so that we can have a reunion. I'm willing to pay the ransom so that we can have a what? A reunion. Now I want you to notice what this reference says. This is powerful. It says, having undertaken the work of man's redemption, the Father would spare how much? Nothing, however dear, which was essential for the completion of his work. Now notice. Now this is so, now look at that highlight, brothers. This is so powerful. Look, notice what this says. It says, he would make opportunities for men. Now what does that mean? Think, oh, think, think with me, saints. What does that mean? He would make opportunities for men. You know what that means? A man might be walking in the wrong direction. And God says, look, I'm going to make an opportunity. You know what God does? He sends a literature evangelist. He sends someone and give them a track or give them some kind of experience that says, look, you're off track. That means God providentially create ways to reconcile man to himself. No matter where you are in life, my brothers and sisters, Jacob was running. He had lied. He had stolen. He had deceived. And guess where that ladder came? Right where he was. You know what God did? He created an opportunity for Jacob to be redeemed. Amen. And praise God, Jacob got on that ladder. Are you with me, brothers? No, wherever your lot is in life, no matter how far you have gone from God, no matter how much you've apostatized, no matter how much you have been disregarding the Bible, the counsels, and the spirit of prophecy, God says, wherever you are, today you can make your calling and election sure. He created opportunities. Today might be your opportunity, my brothers and sisters. He would make opportunities for men. Notice, he would pour upon them his blessings. Now notice, he would heap, what does it mean He Pile up favor after favor, gift upon gift. Notice, until the whole treasury of heaven was open to those whom he came to save. In other words, there's nothing that God will not do, my brothers and sisters, to ensure that you are saved and that I'm saved. Nothing he won't do. It goes on. Notice these words that's highlighted. Having collected how much? All the riches of the universe, and laid open what? All the resources of his divine nature. God gave them how much? All for the use of men. They were his free gift. God spared nothing, my brothers and sisters, so that we can make sure that our calling and our election is sure. In other words, there's nothing that he will not do. What a notion of love is circulating like a divine atmosphere around the world. What manner of love is this? That the eternal God should adopt human nature in the person of his son and carry the name into the highest of heaven. I heard what the preacher say. The text could have read the other way. It could have said, for God so loved his son that he gave up the, the world. In other words, they were at a pinnacle, my brothers and sisters. And God looked at a son that has always been with him. They have always been together, unlimited love, knowing that there was no fault in his son or never will be. And then he looked at this sinful world, the disaster that's going to happen for 6,000 years, his son having to die on a cross, and looked at everything and fact at everything. And God says, look, son, we're going to have to take a chance. It's possible that there might be an eternal separation between me and you. Why? Because God so loved the world that he did what? Gave up his, his son. There was a risk, my brothers and sisters, and we know that inspiration says Jesus did not see beyond the veil of the tomb. They didn't know what was going to happen. It was hid from him. This leads to my title, Two Questions God cannot answer. Let's look at the first one. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Two questions God cannot answer. 
We're studying today why a need of a sanctuary. We're going to pitch a tabernacle this whole year, brothers and sisters. This is essential. Two questions God can answer. First question. Isaiah chapter 5, rather. Isaiah chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. It says, My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. God says, And he fenced it. He gathered out all the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made wine presses therein. And he looked that it should bring forth what? Grapes. And it brought forth what? Wild grapes. Verse 3 says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Then God asks this question. This is the first question that God cannot answer. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it? The question is, who is the vineyard? Notice what it says in verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is what? Is the house of Israel. And God says, and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment and bold oppression for righteousness, but behold, they cry. God says, I have done everything to produce righteousness, and I looked, and I cannot find anything. And then he asked the question, what more could I have done? And God cannot answer that question. You want to know why? Because there's nothing else that he could have done. I gave my life. I've created opportunities. I gave every single angel if necessary. I've created opportunities. You've heard messages. You've had Bible studies. You've heard songs. I've created opportunities after opportunities. And if you choose to be lost, I'll ask myself the question, what more could I have done? And God cannot answer that question, my brother and sister. You want to know why? Because there is no answer. He said, I've given everything. I've demonstrated it. What more could I have done? God cannot answer that question. And there's another question.
Now let's notice what the Bible says in verse 11 and 12. Why is there no escape? Father, in these waning moments, we pray that if there's one here today, Lord, that knows that their heart is not right with thee. As we prepare for this communion, Father, we pray that our hearts may be melted. We pray that our hearts may be softened, dear Lord, so we won't have this experience spoken of by Zechariah. Please, Father, I plead in Jesus' name. Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 11. The Bible says, but they did what? They refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. And as a result, the Bible says, yea, they had made their hearts. They have made their hearts as an adamant stone. They have made their hearts as an adamant stone. It is not God, my brother and sisters. Because God said, what more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done it? And then God says, how shall you escape? There is no escape, my brother and sisters. Because God says, you have turned away your ear. You turned away your shoulder. You turned away your hearts. And now if you're going to be lost, it's not because of me. Do we want to be serious about God's business this year, my brothers and sisters? Do we want God to pitch a tabernacle in our what? In our hearts. Do we want God to pitch a tabernacle in our homes? And do we want God to pitch a tabernacle in our, in our church? It all starts with the heart. And perhaps there's somebody here like Adam and Eve, have caused sin to separate them between their or their God. You know what the blessing of that story is? They didn't go searching for God. You don't, you, you don't, you don't get that. <laughs> they didn't go searching for God. God went searching for them. And God said, Adam, where are you? And then God made them a promise. They couldn't see it, but God made them a promise. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Talking to the serpent, between thy seed and her seed. You know what God wants to do? Put enmity in our hearts today so that we can hate sin. So just like Adam and Eve, God asks us a question. Where are you? He's looking for you, my brothers and sisters. Now, was God looking for their geographical location? No. God was looking for their heart. Something had separated them. Sin. And if we hold on to sin, it's going to cause an eternal separation. So as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, God is looking for someone today. God is looking for someone today. This is why God established a sanctuary, brothers and sisters. This is why God wants us to pitch a tabernacle. So that, that ransom, which is Jesus Christ, can have a reunion. But before this reunion takes place, there has to be a separation from sin. Else there will be a separation from God. There might be somebody here that says, Lord, you've been looking for me. And now I'm going to meet your heart need. Here I am. Remember, the reason why God allowed sin, even though he knew that it caused 6,000 years of degradation, he saw us individually. And there was a place in God's heart for every single individual. And we need to meet God's heart need. I feel impressed to play one more time. Father, please. If there's anyone here waiting today, Lord, help them to block out everything else, every other voice, and only listen to your voice. Please, Father. Don't worry about who's looking. Don't worry about who's thinking whatever thought. 
but to listen to your still small voice that's saying, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? First appeal. You realize you have not been serious about God's business and you're saying, Lord, I want to rededicate myself to you today. Wherever you are, raise your hand. Just raise your hand where you want to rededicate yourself to God. Praise God. I see the hands. I see the hands. That's a general appeal. Second appeal is this. You recognize that you have backslidden. You recognize that you have not truly submitted your hearts to God. You recognize that you have been separated from God. The first appeal is just you want to rededicate. We always want to rededicate ourselves. Are you with me, saints? But this is you recognize that there's something that has truly caused a separation. We always need recalibration, but now there should never be a separation. You recognize that you have separated yourself from God, and you're saying, Lord, today I hear you calling my name. You're calling my name. And I want to give my heart to you today, Father. I've backslidden, and I want to give my heart back to Jesus. Wherever, wherever you are, raise your hands. Wherever you are. Praise God. I see some hands. I see some hands. Third appeal. Very serious. I know we already have some that have made a decision for rebaptism. In the month of April, we plan on having another baptism. You want to begin the preparation so that you can be a part of that baptismal service in April. You hear God calling your name today. And he's saying, Lord, I want to publicly declare that I want to fully give my heart back to you. You want to be rebaptized. Wherever you are, are baptized. Raise your hand. Baptism for the first time as a member of God's remnant church, Seventh day Adventist church, or rebaptism. Wherever you are, raise your hand. I see a hand. Praise God. I see one hand. Praise God. Any other? Any other hands? I see another hand. Praise God. Any other hands? Any other hands? You want to rededicate yourself through rebaptism, more baptism for the first time. Wherever you are, raise your hands. Praise God. Praise God. And as we pray, if God impress your heart, you're saying, Lord, I want to pray this morning. As we go into our communion service, just come forward as we pray. We come forward at this time. Thank God for the sanctuary. Amen, saints. And what makes a sanctuary what it is, is Jesus. So at the same time, we want to say thank God for Jesus. Is there any others that want to come forth with special prayer this morning as we close? Praise God. When you really sit back and contemplate the love of God, my brothers and sisters, it literally marvels you. Marvels you. Any others? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for Jesus, dear Father. We're thankful that the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We didn't know what to do, dear Father. There's nothing that we could have possibly done. It was an unnatural feeling. We didn't know what was taking place. All Adam knew is that the day before he wanted you, he loved you. Then after this experience, he just didn't have that desire for God anymore. But you did something about it, Father. And the reason why you did something about it is so that we can do something about it. 
And we pray that as we understand what you have done, dear Father, that we truly understand what we need to do. You made every sacrifice that was necessary, Lord, so that we can be ransomed. And we pray, Father, that we'll make every sacrifice that is necessary so that we can have a reunion with Jesus. Please, Father, help us to guard our hearts. Help us to examine our hearts, dear Father, and see if there's any wicked thing in it, Lord, so that we can truly be ready when you come. And Lord, we're thankful for those that came forward this morning or raised their hands this morning for baptism or for rededication or for recognizing that they have apostatized from their truth and they want to come back. We're thankful for their hands, Lord. And we pray that you lift them up towards heaven. Give them strength, power. We rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus, Lord. We know he's going to come stronger than ever to try to deceive and to try to separate them once again from you, Lord. But we claim the promise today, Lord, because you remember, we read your words, we had the promise that says, you will avail every single angel, every benefit of heaven, everything that is necessary. You create, create providences and show evidences so that we can be saved. Lord, we pray and claim that promise this morning. And I pray that every face that I saw, we can ascend together on those gates, Lord. Streets of gold, jasper walls, talking to Jesus, talking to Adam, tell him what has taken place over these, well, we can't say 6,000 years, but over our experience, whether 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, and seeing the reunion. As Adam throws down his crown, I can imagine the guilt that he bore for 900 years. He throws down his crown and says, Father, thank you, Jesus. I want to be there. What do we say? Amen. In Jesus' name.